Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 766. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's December 9th, 2022. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is where we sit down and we talk about religion, politics, family, weather, just events that really occur to us to be interesting to us only. And you guys seem to like that. We appreciate that very much. I'm Kevin Carlson. This is George Conger. And we see that there's a lot of new people to the program. You've been watching us the last couple of weeks, and we really appreciate that. Welcome to Anglican Unscripted. Before I get too far, this is where I ask people to like the show. If they see it on YouTube or Facebook, subscribe to the show. You click that little red rectangle and a bell pops out. You click that little bell and all of a sudden you get instant notifications every time we post a new show. The comment section is alive. If you want to really find out what this show is about and want to add your opinion to our ideas, our thoughts, your thoughts, go to the comment section. I was really pleased with last week's show's comments. George, how are you doing this week? Running off my feet. Uh, usually I wear my uh, clergy collar when we film, but I had a uh, funeral, and then we had to go down to the Veterans Cemetery in Bushnell, Florida, Mm -hmm. And man, was it hot. And when I got back here to the church, I had to take off all my clothes and put on my spare clothes because I was soaked through. It's that hot down here. Humid hot. It's humid hot. The, 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 the humidity sometimes in Florida gets to the point where you, you walk outside and without any effort, you have glistening sweat all over. It's like you just apply you know, baby oil to your face. And that's, that's a, one of the unique things about Florida and Singapore. You know, the, where that humidity is attained without effort. Uh, here in uh, Red Bay, we're going to run north to Madison, Wisconsin this week. I got, uh, we did a family call, and my dad's not doing well, and uh, we're looking at uh, uh, saying our last goodbyes this week, and uh, so we'll be heading up there. And uh, just a change in plans. Death is not convenient, as everybody knows, and uh, please keep Jill and I in your prayers as we travel. All right, George, let's move on to the show. Uh, we've not covered a story like this. Uh, Stephen Sizer has been uh, uh, found to have conduct unbecoming of a uh, Church of England clergy person. Now, we reported a- on him. Uh, well, the, we, we've got to be careful here because we've, been, we've reported on him before. We've had threats of lawsuits, so we want to be very careful how we do this. But we're reporting on something somebody else did to Stephen, not us, right? Yes. yes. Um, Stephen Sizer was found guilty by a church tribunal of conduct on becoming a member of, a cler- of the clergy. And that conduct was ut- anti Semitic utterances and posts and activities. Now, let me be clear, that because there's some people, we posted the full, rather than po- post an editorial or a news e- op piece, I just posted the tribunal decision. And immediately people began to spin it. Uh, the Islamic Human Rights Council said he was found not guilty, when he was clearly found guilty. <laughs> uh, but um, the end. Of, this is the first time I, that I can recall, and probably ever, where a clergyman has faced trial for essentially anti-Semitism. Now, let me say, some people have, you know, been posting on uh, the comment section about this, that, well, oh my, uh, this is just a theological issue where, uh, because the Jews don't accept Jesus and Sizer is trying to say they're wrong, they're beating up on him. It's no nothing theological about this It's not, no. Yeah. This is Sizer's was basically found to be in bed uh, associating with people like Hamas, the Iranians, the drive Israel into the sea, sort of the Kanye West level of uh, anti-Semitism, but practiced by Church of England clergymen. Well, you, 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 in mentioning Kanye West, he's kind of that, well, he's a friendly evangelical, can't we still be friends type thing, you know? 
well, Kanye is a black billionaire, and uh, yeah, maybe, right. maybe he, maybe Stephen Sizer wouldn't have been found guilty if he was a billionaire. Who knows? He yeah. might have had better lawyers. Um, that's a, the real story for me. Is in Stephen Sizer's Stephen Sizer's opinions. He's been writing and saying this stuff for twenty plus years. He's very pro-Palestinian, very anti-Israel, state of Israel. Um, which is perfectly fine in the great scheme of things. It's just that he would associate be on a stage with some very unsavory people. Um, it's as if uh, I started hanging out with Louis Farrakhan, and uh, while Farrakhan has gone off on uh, Jews and white people and whatnot, I'm sitting there nodding my head next to him on this podium. People would start to say, George, George, think about where you are. Okay. Um, what's really surprising for me is that the evangelical establishment in England has basically excused Stephen Sizer's behavior all along. Uh, they've known he says this sort of thing, and they just excuse it with, well, he's a good guy. He has good views on the real important issues like women, clergy, and homosexuality. He just has a thing about Jews, and, well, you know, Jews are Jews, and we don't need to worry ourselves about them. It really, to me, is disappointing, the lack of leadership in the Church of England, that nobody took Stephen Steiser's hand about 20 years ago and said, okay, this is a line you really can't cross. Right, yeah. You, you can denounce Christian Zionism. You can denounce Israeli policies. You can be as strong as you want. But when you start moving into anti-Semitic tropes, like the Jews were celebrating the 9-11, therefore it was uh, caused by... Uh, Israeli secret services and stuff. That sort of thing, as an as a theoretical example, <clears throat> that moves you past genuine criticism into kook land. And Stephen Sizer was found to have strayed into kooky land. Well, not an official term, but you know, <laughs> wasn't found in, in the document. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so let's move on to our. Well, you want to talk more about that? No, I just say, well, what happened well, now? He'll probably basically be asked to keep quiet on this issue, which I think is a mistake. I think he has a right to uh, say what he wants and do what he wants. He is a retired priest. Mm -hmm. It's not as if he's saying this from the pulpit. No. Um, he, you know, he, he may be sanctioned of some sort, but I, I myself am a bit of a free speech absolutist. I think he has every right to say these things. He just needs to know there will be some consequences. But well, silence, it, I don't think, should be a consequence. Conduct on becoming a priest in the Church of England is a high bar to hit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we've, we've watched stuff over the last 20 years. Uh, and we're coming up to a later story talking about the, the uh, transgender Jesus. Um, that's a high bar to hit the Church of England. And for his defenders, I think they're right that he may be being treated unequally. Yeah. Um, because there are so many worse things going on. Now, for those who were offended, and, and if you're a member of the Jewish bo uh, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, this may be as bad as it gets because you feel under attack sure. uh, constantly and have the Church of England, a loose cannon going around saying these things. You, that's bad. That you feel attacked. But given the great moral problems of British society, for the church really just to only jump on Stephen Sizer because he is an evangelical and has no friends in high places. Um, it's a shame. It is. So, so I don't excuse at all what he says. I condemn what he says, <clears throat> but I don't think he's been treated fairly as compared to other people. Unequal application of justice. Right. And there is a bigger story here, and that is the people who are really unbecoming uh, in their role as a clergy person who never make the, the news at all. All right, George, let's move on. India, there's a new moderator, the Church of North India. Uh, the current moderator, uh, Bishop Singh, was defrocked with an 8,000-page indictment letter. Oh, my Lord, what did they find, George? Well, he was Bishop Singh was the moderator of the Church of North India, and when he got back from the Lambeth Conference after vacation in Europe, he was arrested at the airport by the Treasury officials, by the uh, basically the tax man, and he was charged, and he has been held in custody ever since he got off the plane for money laundering and tax evasion. 
Now, there have been local state-level investigations of him for good old-fashioned corruption. Well, when they arrested him, they raided his home and they found a quarter of a million dollars in cash, deeds to 17 properties in his names and his children's names, uh, nine luxury cars, bars of gold and jewels and silver, all this stuff. And the Church of North India said, hmm, I think this is grounds for conduct on becoming a member of the clergy, uh, stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from the church, selling church properties and all this and that. So he was deposed and a new moderator was installed, uh, Bishop uh, uh, B.J. Nayak of Fulbani is the new moderator. Now, on Monday, the prosecution from the Treasury Department filed an 8,000-page indictment detailing every single criminal act. And Indian justice is notoriously slow uh, through winding its way through the courts. Yep, and if they're going to go through 8,000 pages of stuff, how many years is this going to take while he's in jail? Uh, man, oh, man. Yeah, that it, it well somehow in his role he wasn't just committing crimes, he became a crime boss. Mm. You know, this is when you got millions of dollars at your disposal and properties amongst uh uh yourself and your your uh relatives crime boss. L- little higher uh, uh level there. Yeah, I don't know. Well I I you know my prayer is that uh, India can reform itself, and if it's, if the church can't do it, you know, hopefully the courts and new leadership can. You know, my hope is the church could do it. All right, moving on to news. Uh, we've reported on uh, uh, Bishop-elect Charlie Holt since he was first elected bishop uh, to Florida uh, this summer, and he's went through a second election after objections, and he won that. Now there's been a sec. Uh, they've objected objected to the second election, George, and Charlie Holt has responded to that. Yeah, we reported last week about Charl- about the uh, protests against the election, uh, where I may I was I am of the opinion that uh, there was deliberate dirty dealing here by the by those protesting. They want they set it up to fail. Mm-hmm. Well, Charlie Holt issued a letter, <clears throat> and it was a very humble letter. Uh, he he acknowledges that this is humiliating to him and it's very difficult for him and his family and but he is not casting stones he's looking to find common ground with people who may oppose him on the issues of homosexuality um and charlie truly is truly trying to take the high road and we'll see if his opponents meet him on that road or if they continue to do this sort of dirty business that has been uh but uh, at all costs, we must prevent a conservative evangelical from becoming Bishop of Florida, even to uh, doing dirty tricks. So Charlie is not responding in anger. He's responding in humility, in love, in trusting in the Lord that uh, this will all unfold according to his will. And I give Charlie credit for being a bigger man than most people. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was trying to think back. Since the formation of the ACNA, how many moderate to conservative bishops has the Episcopal Church allowed to, to reach that office? And Fort Worth, maybe? Uh, I can't think of that many. One or two? Well, not Fort Worth, because Jack Eicher was in there a long uh, yeah time. i'm sorry dallas whatever dallas would it be yeah. one yeah. uh central florida with uh, greg brewer yeah but but greg brewer is not rock the boat um that's two so that's two i can't really think of that many more and i'm sure there there may be some more um, but so but, in 13 in 13 years uh two moderate to conservative bishops have been allowed through uh Steve Bauerschmidt of Tennessee, maybe. Yeah. Um, All right, I'll give you that. Three <laughs> have been allowed through, and that's 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 oof. That's hard to 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 realize. Only three have made it through in thirteen years, George. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 
well, we'll see what happens with the next bishop of Central Florida. Uh, the, the process here in Central Florida for the election of a new bishop is really bad. Is it? Um, it it's not been done well at all. But that's not meant that we don't have good candidates. We have three right. very different, very good candidates who are unfortunately in a crappy system. But, you know, the Lord has a way of uh, God loves... Uh, drunks, the United States of America, and the Diocese of Central Florida, <laughs> he and does. we will muddle through. <laughs> he does. All right. Next news story. Uh, we have four new Church of England bishops, uh, and we should talk about this because they're all a tad bit different, to say the least. Uh, Stephen Race, Bishop of Beverly, George. Yeah, the Stephen Race was just installed, consecrated as Bishop of Beverly. That's the Anglo-Catholic flying bishop for the mm -hmm. north of England. And Paul Thomas was appointed the bishop of Oswestry, which will be the flying Anglo-Catholic bishop for southern England. And Paul has a very impressive beard. He looks like an Old Testament prophet. Yes, where the mustache, he's had a few more years to work on the mustache, so the <clears throat> mustache is prominent and then the beard is full. Mm -hmm. uh, woodsy uh, lumberjack look. And then today, Monday, uh, Friday, Rob Monroe was named the Evangelical Flying Bishop, and he will have the title of Bishop of Ebb's Fleet. Each of these three men have 20 plus years of parish ministry, are very highly regarded by their peers, mm -hmm. and are people who a generation ago would be bishops normally. Uh, but in this day and age in the Church of England, they have to be slotted into these protected Fl uh, fly bishop fly, roles. flying yeah. bishop thing and meanwhile in all this jane her name is spelled man wear main wearing i don't know if she pronounces it uh, mannering or man wearing or however mm -hmm. she pronounces it main wearing but yeah. jane uh is an archdeacon and she's to be bishop of hertford which is suffragan c assistant c Mm -hmm. And her picture comes out, and she looks like she's my daughter's age. You know, she's a little spotty, <laughs> little, little ugly, young. with you know long blondish hair, and uh, I don't oh. know how old she is. If, but if she's sixty and looks that well, wow! <laughs> great jeans, great jeans, <laughs> great jeans. Yeah. Uh, but my my point is that if if you look at her career, it doesn't hold a candle to these three guys. Um, now they may be a little older. Mm -hmm. But still, that you know, she uh, she's a, she likes to tweet and likes to be on Facebook, and she tweeted a message before her announcement of her uh, selection that she <clears throat> laments that the Church of England doesn't allow gay marriages, but you can come to her parish and she'll bless your gay relationship. So, so she's openly out there on the pro-gay side. Um, oh, hold on, wait a little while. You won't have to be lamenting that at all. I don't think. Yeah. And and she really doesn't have that. She has an impressive career from a careerist point of view. In other mm -hmm. words, positions, administrative positions held, committees. Uh, she's been on uh, uh, appointments she's been given. But as to actual real life-changing parish work, she doesn't really hold a candle to the three, uh, Monroe, uh, Thomas, and uh, Race. And it's just unfortunate that we have an unequal system here, that the official Church of England search process for bishops comes up with these mediocrity, mediocrities, people who really are not impressive as, cl as clergy, let alone bishops, whereas the unofficial process to give the flying bishops picks three quite good that could be bishops in Australia, in the United States, if the Episcopal Church would allow them, uh, they could be any, uh, Canada, Africa. These could be. These are these men, from what I know, and I don't know everything, but from what I know, have that charism of being a father of God. They have the charism of episcopacy. They're a bishop for the whole church. Mm -hmm. You can't really say that about many of the bishops that have come out during Welby's tenure. Well, now let's back up. Do they have the candidates available to, to lift them up to that position? 
you know, certainly the evangelical the, and the uh, Anglo-Catholics do, but do it, it, are the in general clergy able to raise up to the the bishop level, or are they just being picked out of the, uh, the kind of the virtual signaling, the, the token bishops, George? <sighs> it's a system that starts when you're young. Um, you know, Gavin Ashenden, when he was a liberal, you know, mm-hmm. was very very much petted and put forward, then he got religion, so to speak. And <laughs> he became a believer, career, darn him. <laughs> and his career hit a hit a stone wall going 60 yeah. miles per hour. Boom. Mm-hmm. You know, stopped dead in its track because he started believing in Jesus Christ instead of believing in causes and issues. So, and Gavin is neither, uh, was neither a member of the evangelical team or the Anglo-Catholic team. So the answer is, um, Believing it, parish ministry and an overt faith in Jesus Christ is a hindrance, not a help, to becoming a bishop in the Church of England. I think believing in the concept of Jesus is a way to get forward in uh, the administration part of the Church of England. Believing in the real Jesus is a hindrance. You know? And just that we mentioned Gavin, he's been in the news... Uh, with his difficulties with the Catholic Church, he's had to withdraw from the ordinariate mm-hmm. because they told him that he's too controversial. And I feel very badly for Gavin because he's basically discovered that the Church of England hierarchy in England and in Rome may not be that much better than the Catholic hierarchy in England <laughs> may yes. not be that much better than the Church of England hierarchy in England. Gavin would argue that we have the magisterium and we have that the Catholic Church can be saved from its bishops, while the Church of England and the Anglican world will rise and fall with its bishops. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a strong criticism. And, you know, and right now, I can't say, you know, from where I'm sitting, I, I hope it's so. You know, somebody needs to, to, to stand up and say, this is a mess. The Church, even the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, uh, and the Anglicans, all of you, uh, you need to, to, to slow up and pay attention. I'll get some emails on that one. All right, so <clears throat> let's see more news. Derby Cathedral hit by eco terrorists. Now, we've seen this phenomenon now almost the entire year where uh, people who want to stop us from using fossil fuels find a, a, a can of glue and glue themselves to a painting in the Louvre or somewhere in Europe and uh, they make the news or they uh, glue themselves to the road and sit in traffic or they glue themselves together. The, the one I really liked is the people who uh, glued themselves to a podium last week I didn't know that the podium could be moved. So the security guard just lifted up the podium and took them out and arrested them. <laughs> so, hey, don't do that again. So the equal terrorists have finally hit a, a cathedral, George, and I didn't see it in the news. It made the local news in England. It made Derby yeah. Live, the uh, local uh, online news service. <clears throat> but here's the thing. On Sunday, was it? Yeah, a uh, week ago Sunday, I think it was. Uh, at the 10.30 service, the main choral uh, sung Eucharist at Derby Cathedral, uh, as people were coming up to receive Holy Communion, a group of people marched up uh, in front of the altar area, unfurled banners and signs, and one of their number climbed into the lectern and started haranguing the congregation of the evils of the Church of England. So far, so good. I mean, I get yeah, it all that. Yeah. But her, she was haranguing the Church of England on owning stocks and oil companies and how uh, it was con- it was uh, contributing to the destruction of the planet, all the usual environmental stuff. Now, first off, it's not the Church of England, but the church commissioners who own the stocks, but be it as it may. Well, uh, a, 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 a wonderful reporter found out that the school she went to also owns those stocks. So, go yeah. on. So, <laughs> well, you know, consistency and intelligence is not a hallmark of these people. But... Here's the thing. Uh, it was, it's now so ordinary, disrupting. It, it, you know, we started off disrupting public transport, uh, art, art museums. Now we're attacking churches. And now that we've reached that level of attacking churches during services, it's of no interest. It's like in the United States, we've had this problem going on a year or two now 
with uh, abortion clinics and Catholic churches in particular being targeted by uh, uh, militant pro-abortion activists. Uh, Jane's uh, List, I think, or Jane's something or other. I want to say Jane's Obsession, but that's a music group. But Jane's something is a militant feminist group that announced that they're going to start shooting uh, up uh, 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 family resource centers, pro-life centers. And the FBI uh, doesn't do anything because their focus is on catching all these white supremacists, all three or four of them in the United States. And two of the three they've arrested have been black. But hey, you know, uh, so in other words, it's open season on Christians, on the faithful, on those seeking to do good by those promoting what I consider to be the demonic. I'm not saying climate change activists are demonic. I'm talking about the abortion people, but still, they're using the same tools. I'm going to put a link to a story here um, so people can be more informed. But there's a statistician who does a lot of uh, work with this. And, you know, he did the stats and said that uh, more violence against pro-life people than against pro-choice since the Supreme Court leaked the May 3rd. 135 attacks on pro-life people between the Supreme Court leak on May 3rd and September, and only six attacks were identified in the other direction. That's Mm -hmm. quite a difference. Yet, if you read the papers, watch news, go to websites, you would think that the pro-life people are walking into abortion places with AK-47s. Yeah, that's and that's you know the FBI's latest uh, little thing is that the greatest threat for uh, the homes uh, homeland security, the greatest threat facing the United States, there are two: climate change and white supremacists. You know, okay, what where where did we get these people? How did we arrive at this point where? I mean, Kevin, when you and I were little, there was the TV show, The FBI, starring Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> and the G-Man was the square sh- you know, the square shooting, uh-huh. you know, man, impeccable, no politics, uncorruptible, incorruptible. And now we've got this FBI that arrest- arrests homeschooling parents uh, and sees the parents protesting at school boards to be a greater threat than ISIS and Al-Qaeda and uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter. Um, we're 20 years, world. yeah, 20 years ago, something that would make the news would be uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury visits Ukrainian graves. That would be in the news. It would make at least page five in the New York Times, it would hit the, the Wall Street Journal, it would hit all the English papers. That would be something that, wow, I want to read. Archbishop of Canterbury, a symbol of Anglicanism, a, sim- a symbol of, uh, you know, something good happening in the world. And he, Welby went this week to visit Ukrainian Gaves, and I didn't see it anywhere. Well, Nobody. we... We posted the story from the Lambeth Palace press office, and I have to say it had the lowest viewership, readership of any story on Anglican Inc. this past week. Oh, yeah, easily. Uh, it, I, it, may, it may have had competition from Malaysian Archbishop protests, uh, coalition government, but I think that beat out Justin Welby in Kiev. Yeah. So what is that, te- what is that telling us? Um, it's not that I downplayed or did any sort of tricks on our side no. it just just i think there's an exhaustion with just it, it was a double header uh it was exhaustion with justin welby and and his politicking and, ex, and an exhaustion with the war in, in the ukraine yeah um, okay. people just yeah. don't care anymore we pay for a service that automatically feeds Anglican Inc. stories into uh, Facebook uh, pages, into Yahoo News pages, and the Google pages. Uh, every story gets the same play uh, as far as distribution into uh, the social media. And uh, I you know, came up in the in the, the lower 20 there, George. And uh, Well, you know, like the Stephen Sizer story, where we just posted the, the tribunal decision, not even mm-hmm. any opinion that was sort of spicy. We had it 20 mm-hmm. times as many readers yeah. over the same three or four day period. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and like there is a story out of the Ukraine that again, our mainstream media, this is this is tangentially religious, but I still think it is an issue of faith in here is that some people may remember back in October that Joe Biden changed US nuclear defense policy. Ever since the Truman administration and through uh, Donald Trump, the US government has pledged not to use nuclear weapons in a first strike. No first strike. Um, we would use nuclear weapons if we were attacked with nuclear weapons. That's Those are the circumstances. And over the course of the Cold War, there were a number of times, some that we don't know details about in the public, but others that we do know about, where the world came close to nuclear annihilation, but because the Russians knew that we wouldn't be the ones to fire off the missiles first, we were able to get out of Armageddon. Joe Biden has dropped that strategy. And the uh, new strategy is that uh, we may use nuclear weapons as a first strike in response to tactical battlefield issues. Well, Vladimir Putin this week said, fine, if the US is going to be using first strike nuclear weapons, we now are going to keep an eye on the US fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean and the US military in Germany. And if we think there's any evidence that they're going to use a first strike on the battlefield nuclear weapons, we'll hit them first. Now, people say that Vladimir Putin is paranoid, and now we're giving him license, basically, to attack <laughs> us. And it's not just the Americans who should be concerned, because the Russian government has announced that they know, to their satisfaction, they have figured out who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, it was the SBS, the Special Boat Service, of the British SAS. So the Brits blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. And in the Russians' mind, they've committed an act of war against Russia. So if they, so we, it, I'm not a, and I'm not at some think tank spending my days thinking about this stuff. I'm a simple parish priest, but friends, if I can read this stuff coming out of Moscow, I wish somebody else would who has some authority in our government and really see that we are really are at nice edge here. No, and th there's a truism to that. We do have people who are paid to do that, uh, deal with uh, nuclear waste management and stuff like that, that uh, we, we certainly uh, have empowered some decision-making to, but we'll have to see. We're in a very crazy war. Um, I may have had the mute button off last time I said this, but excuse the noise in the background. Uh, I'm having work done on the RV. They're buffing out of scratch. My apologies. Let's move on to the next story and talk about Fox News picks up on the trans Jesus story. I didn't see it very many other places, though. Well, it's. I think it's... Uh, Last week, we reported about a uh, Cambridge graduate student gave a sermon where he likened, uh, he said Christ could be transgender because some of these medieval pictures that he was looking at, some of these wounds of Christ look like vaginas to him. Well, it says more about this guy than it says about anything else, that he sees vaginas everywhere. But Fox News, of all people, the mainstream, this is a story that crossed the secular religious uh, blood brain barrier in the news cycle. Fox News contacted the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York. What do you have to say about a priest in the Church of England and a theological school saying this stuff? And Justin Welby's office says, well, he's off in the Ukraine traveling. Uh, he can't help you. And the Archbishop of York said he has no comment on the matter. So Justin Welby can yak away about how bad British immigration policy is. He can go to the Ukraine and have nobody watch him weep over mass graves. But when there is a true theological issue, is Jesus transgender? Well, it's a pretty easy one for Justin to answer with no real downside. Neither York nor Canterbury can be counted on to stand up for the Christian faith. Well, it'd be interesting if they start offering war chest tests uh, before you uh, uh, can be competent 
in the pulpit in Church of England. You know those ink spot tests they gave. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've all you know when you become go through the ordination process in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church in North America, you have to do these psychological tests. Make sure you're not crazy. Um, I think they should also do that when you become a bishop, because I am very confident there are some bishops who would never have been bishops if their sanity had been checked before hands were laid on their little heads. Indeed. All right. So that's it for today. A short story week for you. Uh, once again, uh, keep me in your prayers as I head north. Uh, and uh, and uh, please pray for Georgia's daughter. She got food poisoning. How's she doing? Laura has what they call deli belly. Uh, she uh, Laura's in uh, New Delhi. It was in New Delhi visiting mm -hmm. friends, and she ate some food at a uh, sidewalk stand and got deathly ill. Was hospitalized for two days. And then uh, she checked herself out and went to a friend's house in Bombay. And I have to say, when people in India are wealthy, they are wealthy. I mean, so Lara is staying in, the pictures look like a Maharaja's palace where there are like 20 or 30 servants taking care of her every need and giving her bedpans every two seconds and all this and that. And so she's, she'll be fine, but uh, I... Uh, as a father with a young daughter backpacking through India, I am very glad for the existence of these super wealthy Indians, crazy rich Asians. Uh, well, it, now, he, get better. I have two daughters also, and here's the test that you have a, a wonderful daughter. When did you find out she had food poisoning? Uh, when she asked me, could I send her the forms for insurance reimbursement for the hospital? <laughs> 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 not oh dad i'm in the hospital no it's like oh i just left the hospital can you uh send money yeah i know that's that's a typical child i'm kevin carlson and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 776 of anglican unscripted